unmute to go. Hello, everyone. Welcome to today's live broadcast, How to Meet the Challenge of Counting and Analyzing Tumor Cells Circulating in the Peripheral Blood Presented to You by today's keynote speaker, Dr. Jacinto Scholes. I'm Christina Jewell of LabRoots, and I'll be your moderator for today's event. We are delighted to bring you this educational web seminar presented by LabRoots, the leading scientific social networking website and provider of virtual events and webinars advancing scientific collaboration and learning. We have a few important announcements before we begin. This webcast is designed to be interactive, and we encourage you to ask questions during the event. You can submit questions by typing them in the Q&A box, which can be found by clicking on the green Q&A button at the lower left of the presentation window. We will try to answer as many questions as we can. You can enlarge the slide window by clicking on the screen icon in the lower right-hand corner of the slide window. If you have any technical problems viewing or hearing this presentation, please click on the support button at the top right of your presentation window. Or you can submit your problem through the green Q&A button on the lower left. This is an educational webinar and thus offers free continuing education credits. After the webinar is over, please click on the CE button located in the bottom left-hand corner of your webpage and follow the process of obtaining your credits. I would now like to introduce today's speaker, Dr. Giacinto Schools. Giacinto Schools is Donner Professor of Science Emeritus at Princeton University, Distinguished Adjoint Professor in the Department of Physics and Biology at Temple University, and Associated Member of the Nanotech Institute of the National Res Council of Italy in Lecce, Italy. His career has spanned an unusually long length of time and, an, and an, an equally unusually broad range of subjects that ranges from mass spectroscopy to molecular beams, from surface science to superfluid HE droplets, and from biomolecular nanosensing to medical diagnostics. He has received several recognitions. The Hirschbach Prize in 2013, the Gold Medal of Honor of the Italian Chemical Society, the Ben Franklin Medal for Physics in 2006, two honorary doctorates, 1997 and 2000, the Dubai Prize of the ACS, the Plyler Prize of the APS, and the Lippincott Award of the OSA. He is a fellow of the APS, OSA, and of the Royal Society of the UK, and of the Royal Science Academy of the Netherlands, KNAW. He has published about 300 papers in peer-reviewed journals, and he has been quoted by his colleagues approximately 19,000 times. His age index is 74. He has supervised about 100 PhD students, an unusually high percentage of which now covers positions of responsibility in academia and research. I will now turn it over to Dr. Scholes for his presentation. Dr. Scholes? Yes. Yeah. So, the um, subject of today's metabolic phenomena is the basis for enumerate CTCs. I'd like to convince you by the end of this talk that liquid biopsies, as they are being called at present, are up and coming and they will revolutionize the diagnostics in cancer. For instance, there is a mini review out now, July 1st, in cancer letters that makes exactly the same point. The authors are Maltoni and Al, and the CTC is in early breast cancer, the past worth taking, the title is. You can find it on the web. Okay. In the first slide, I'd like to tell you, first of all, this, this work was done in the framework of a near C European Research Council grant, which I got five years ago. The grant is just finished. And a second grant is called a cactus because it is a proof of concept grant where we get some money to proof one of the concepts developed during the fundamental work during, during, during the critical whole grant. We, our group is called Mona Lisa, Molecular Nanotechnology for Life Science Applications. It's been working in the last five years at the University of Udine. Well, <clears throat> from January, 17, maybe moving to Nanotech, an institute in southern Italy, 
the Institute of National Research Council of Italy. Okay. Concentration today is in the diagnostic link. At present, you get at the beginning of a chemotherapy, the chemotherapy cycle. You treat the chemotherapy drugs, and then after a few weeks, eight weeks or minimum, you go for diagnostic tools to see if the, the disease has been progressing or not, which is very slow and expensive to do. But um, if you look for CTCs, circulating cells in the peripheral blood, you spend much less money. After one week, you have an answer if the chemotherapy cycle is working or not because the cell number remains constant, constant or increases, and you know it's not working. They go down, it's working. Therefore, you can really make progress in one week versus eight weeks or, or even 10 or 16 weeks sometimes. And therefore, you can block metastasis before they form, not after they form, which is essential for survival of the patient. These CTCs can be counted in breast cancer, colorectal cancer, prostate. Most cancers have CTCs. Brain cancer don't have, in general, not. Some brain cancers do have CTCs. Technology is not available everywhere to count them. It's a problem because this technique is used very, very seldomly. Quite clearly, they're not seeing the weak link in cancer care because it's limited sensitivity, is low, and often expensive. Counting circulating tumor cells can be faster and more sensitive. There are very few major events, 10, maybe 20 tumor cells per 10 to 9 blood cells, which is very relevant. But if you can, are able to count them, I will show you how can be counted in a moment, you get, you get prognosis, prediction, therapy efficiency. And potential information, CDC isolation, the genomics, the sensitivity resistance, which is very important because that's what the task is do typically. So, for me, et al., in 204, make a fundamental paper and they start in this field basically. In 207, Victor, Ebon in 208, Cohen in 208, Krebs in 212, and Planck in Science 213, a very important review. If you then establish counting with the blood of each patient, you establish a certain drug can work or not, then you, you establish the basis of what's called personalized medicine. However, personal medicine is a very, very useful concept for, for will require a very large um, course of, of patients and very lots of work, and it's not even sure it will establish itself very fast. You can take a group of patients, classify the patients in groups, and then when there are common phenotypes, you can make a general statement for those in the whole group and make a therapy which is good for the whole group, which is a kind of personalized medicine, but not quite personalized. And that's going to work much earlier and can be established with good clinical practice in the near future, in my opinion. So why is this the original technology of why they use in clinical practice? The gold standard in this field is the Veridex machine. It's been used until recently. Veridex by Johnson & Johnson, monitor CTC via magnetic wound sensing, antibodies linked to magnetic nanoparticles. Then you extract them and count them, and fix them in, into a, a substrate and count them. EPCAM, typically EPCAM antibodies are used linked to magnetic nanoparticles, and if those are, are being used, only epithelial cells are, are counted because only epithelial cells 
express EPCAM antibodies can be obtained with EPCAM antibodies on the nanoparticles. But we know, and we show at the end of this talk, that the epithelial to the transition transitions quite cells cannot be counted. So that's a big problem. That's why certain cancers show very little circulatory tumor cell, where it says there may be much more. So let's discuss a bit about metastatic tumors. The major cause of cancer associated with mortality is tumor metastasis. It has been different greatly from primary tumor issue in terms of genetic characteristics. That's contained in the consequence of therapy, taking biopsy from a patient. Patients, however, is an invasive procedure and pretty impossible due to the lack of accessible lesions. Cancer diagnostic is a weak link, too slow and too expensive. Take up for four months to see if the therapy is working or not. Nature, there's a review, September 2013, states this concept very clearly. So it would be nice to have a cheap and diagnostic, fast diagnostic tool. Years ago, I asked two new students in my group, my first two MD students, Fabio Ben and Matteo Turetta, to come up with a proposal for such a tool. Two weeks later, they proposed to me to use the biomarker for cancer. To my big surprise, no one had thought of just that. There were lots of studies about how the, bio, the, the biology of these cells was different than the fundamental cells, making the normal tissue, and therefore the idea was and stay forward, but nobody has thought to count CTCs used using the, the, the metabolism as a biomarker. Why? Because basically it happens that the, the glycolysis changes. You know, you know, fundamental cell. Just a moment. Let's change slide. The metabolic phenomenon is called the variable effect. been known for about 100 years almost. And, it's, and the difference in body metabolism between differentiated tissue and the tumor tissues. In, um, in differentiated tissues, most of the energy of the, of the glucose goes into producing ATPs, so going to the energy of the, of the, of the cells. Uh, oxidative phosphorylation produces 36 more of ATP for one molecule of glucose. Anaerobic phosphorylation in, in, in the differentiated tissue says two molecules of ATP per one molecule of glucose. But instead, in a tumor, it's totally different. Glucose produces pyruvate or lactate, depending on what is, is the tissue. And lactate is basically acidic, and then the protons are killed out of the cell very fast. Acidify the environment around them, but as it is well known, moreover, that every tumor is kind of acidic environment. It cannot be determined that because first of all you have to determine the acidity of the tumor, which is not easy to do. And however, if you have a, a, a neoplastic cell walking, swimming into the blood, you isolate it and you can measure the. the metabolism of sugar in it, and if you expand, if you isolate the cell in a little drop of water or blood, then you can see if the acidification goes on into the blood and is not diluted into the blood, the whole body, so you can see it. The working principle is therefore to detect pH changes in the extracellular environment in a single cell level. We can do that by encapsulating every single cell in the droplet. So we can encapsulate it by making a kind of a microfluidic cell. And in a 50 micron cell, 50 picoliters, you have a cell in it, you have a droplet, and you can make it flow. The Medidex cell search apparatus. Principle is protein expression. The principle we're going to detect metabolic differences in pico droplets. The spectrum of detection in, in the epithelial cells is very narrow. For us, every 
all phenotypes produce the same viable effect. Is the, is, the, is the cancer, is the cell is neoplastic, it will do that, and therefore the spectrum is response is broad. You need to know which type of phenotype of the cell we are going to announce if this moreover the white blood cells may also respond a bit to acidification, but not the mind to the at least not the mind to less than the cancer cells. Cell isolation is not possible. The cell are fixed, cannot be cultured in since they are swimming in the, in the blood, we can separate the cells and then study the genomics of it and see if it's the genome is changed from the metastasis, from the primary tumor, and therefore we can see if there is uh, resistant drugs developing or not. The cost is very few euros, less than 50 euros, 10 euros or so, and you, how you can calculate the cost. Well, a very next point costs 500 euros. Not, not terribly expensive, but still something you know, make it be made close, close to the time of the day. Those is like this. It starts with seven and a half centimeters of the plastic drawer blood. And going to the microfluidic circuit, the microscope, micro, reverse the microscope, and you can interrogate if the certification happened to the cell or not. Here is the, it was a movie here, but Imagine this oil flowing and the blood making droplets. You make very many droplets per second. Then the droplets may contain or may not contain a cell, but most of them will contain cells. Incubation 10 minutes, 37 degrees with sugar. And here's the result. As you can see here, several, several droplets. There's one with a rather large cells in it, which is a petilia probably, and it has cancers, and therefore has right, a bit of fluorescence here because we are using, as I will show you in a moment, a, a ratio meter method to measure, the, measure the, the acidity of the cells. Here, as you can see here, just a moment I will show you. tools here, but uh, the cells which is faintly largest for essence from, from the, from, it's not a kind of separate for white cells which are contributing to increasing a bit of fluorescence, acidification of the cell, or the droplet, but not, not much. Okay, let me hide this. Methods. There is a continuous phase of Emulsification in the, in the microfluidic environment. We use fluorinated oil, 2% in weight, surfactant, dispersed phase, cell suspension, and then you have various teeth, SNARF, two micromolar, asymmetric pH sensitive dye. To spectroscopy with that, and you can fluorate dispersed phase 300 microliters per hour. Continuous phase, 400 microliters per hour, injection rate at 100 to 100 microliters per hour. So we are still slow, you know, but I'm going to several channels in parallel. We can speed up the method at arbitrarily. Microfluidic is like this. You can use the multi channel possibilities that you easily have. We are not using them yet because we are still going to the maturation stage with technology, but we have a machine that works. Actually, two machines that work at present. Just a second. Uh, 
Lap size are pico droplets, 45 micro in diameter, 50 picoliters, typically. Or actually, so much smaller than that. The pump is a better sucking the, the oil and pushing it because so this way the, the cells are always under negative pressure. And you adhere to the pulse of the machine less. You can have more quantitative yields, and then this is what you have. You then have to examine the fluorescence coming from the cells. Double goes on, double goes on to a cell here, where in the light upper right corner of the slide. Here, goes through the sheet of light and gets analyzed. And you can take a picture if there is a cell in it, because there's no cells, there is some very few droplets get acidic without cells in it, but you don't count them. If there is a cell and the droplet and becomes acidic, then the cell is cancerous. It's neoplastic. As simple as that. So we go further. some results. I lost the slide here. Okay. Here we need to calibrate the machine first. We have this uh, two one single dilate and two emissions from it, depending on the acidity. The ratio can change. This first part, upper left corner of the slide, where the two peaks are equal, is establish the condition in this way. So in you have ratio one, you have the droplets are not acidic. pH is 7.4, and you have 7.2 or something, and then you seven, six point seven, five point something, and you see the ratio increases steadily. So uh, you can plot uh, many, many points, many peaks, you can have a good precision in the calibration, and you take, there's no size in it. The droplets are, are there, and you can change the size of the droplet by calibrating the pH. In this way, animation can be seen. The next slide. You see that there, very precisely done. Less than one percent. Physical errors, and the other calibration here changes from 7.4 to less than five. The pH of the of the, of the droplets. Now, if you can look in the microscope and find the cells in the droplet and the cell is acidic, then you count that there's two more cells. You can also sort them. It picks. But let me first convince you that we are looking, what we are looking at. First, I have two underlying step cell lines to look at. See, you know, this is a white blood cell line, and there's no, no, no signification changes. So one or one point one, one point five starting signification, and, and you expose the to sugar for ten minutes, which is a standard ten minutes of glucose, and then you can see if you have a breast cancer cell line, you have full signification the ratio goes up to four. Two points are, are normally large. The bulk of the cells is in, this, in the region of 2.5 or so. Example positive events, you can see that in the center of each slide, you have a, events where the ratio changes. And some events, see even the, the cells coming through. 
in the fluorescence and changing. And then you see the same effects for all types of cancer tested. Best metastatic carcinoma. You can see here, most of them goes to two. And there are some possibly white, white blood cells participating in the events, but that's a very limited number, very near one. Correct cancer, same, two lines of white blood cells probably. The bulk of cancer cells is changing up to 2.5, and ovarian cancer can then have a clear cell. There are lots of of events. Now, to, cal to calibrate the incubation time, you start doing few minutes, 10 minutes, saturating type of. So you don't need to do more than 10 minutes because the rest is, remains constant. Of course, you have more saturation here. We call the cells up into the, into the acidic environment while the others remain down. The others are empty, in this case, are empty droplets. Now, we spike the samples into the blood. These are cells spike into the whole blood of breast cancer. You, you like to, to speed up the process, you like away all the white red blood cells, and then you also in, you can in, to speed up again, deplete also with white blood cells with CD44, 45 depletion, and then you are left with something like 10, 50,000 cells from 10 to 9 starting, and you, need, you have all the neoplastic changes, cells in it. In this case, you start with a, with a sample of this type. You have, in this case, a cancer cell with antidopers or, or cells, not, not, no, not neoplastic cells. And then you see more clearly in the next slide. Exodonal rice blood, no, no events. And it's a breast cancer cell spike into the blood, then you see them. But this is why we established that in present condition, which we are pushing the, the blood through, we can, we don't have a lot of yield, 30, 40% of yield, and by this, some cells are disappearing, so we see two percent of cells in the blood. We recover only say half a percent. That's so important because we don't get any other patients, any other defects. In exio patient samples, in antidonalized blood, no events. The spike I showed you before. You need a correct metastatic patient. As you can see, same type of effect. Some cells are changing, but a few now, only a few, because even two of the metastatic, every metastatic patient, there are not many cells in this. And these are empty cells, empty droplets, or droplets with white blood cells. Conclusions first. You can discriminate between cancer cells and white and White blood cells, this, the metabolism is good enough to do that. Spike a lot, we can attack cancer in line, cell lines in blood. We have a similar, similar pattern of the cancer cell line. So we, we are confident that we are detecting the, the cancer cells. However, we, we need to have more additional data. We need to sort drop it out so that it's possible to, to sort them out, measure the genomics in it, and establish if the uh, same, same genome as the, as the cell in the tumor or has changed and the, and the metastasis are the same as the metastatic thing.
in the beginning we do comparison with patients where biopsies have been taken in classical way, compared with our type of biopsy. Eventually, when we're confident in they're doing the right thing, you can do biopsies only in the blood, liquid biopsies, and one of the type of present of liquid biopsies, you can analyze the cDNA, microRNAs, RNAs, and all kind of stuff. And our, we believe that going after the cells is more reliable than going after the DNA, because DNA can happen from other cells too, and then from only to source out. Well, it's much more sensitive, and you can do a good job too. But it's important not to have to rely on on classic methods, on classic biopsies, which are very damaging and may have actually the spread of the cancer. Just a second. We need to, especially we need to validate our say. We need to have clinical time. In particular, we need to compare our results those of various apparatus. Spread differences, but consistent in the case of equivalent measurements, which I mean by this. In order to investigate this point, we, another group in my, in my group here has done a different type of activity. Has analyzed the blood of patients, of breast cancer patients, very slowly, but very deeply, so that we could come to some conclusions about possible differences in the index. I would like to thank the people so far, Barshouk, yeah, about the university. He's a specialist of any disruptive like microfluidics, much as Rita. And if I would bang and the two students who have basically carry out this work, and I have a such a lot the Nina Sandy is the one who is going to supervise the work of Nikela Bolfoni, which is the one I'm going to report now. So we sent out 130 patients enrolled, but then we could make only 60, 65 because the grant was stopped. Escape me what type of judgment they used to stop the grant, but in any case, we have been, have been able to do the work of 65 patients, and the workflow was as follows. One take lays away the, the red blood cells, incubation with C45, medical bleach, staining antibodies, and its separation, and then using a deep array, deep array machine, which is very slow, but very precise, has about 10,000 um, little situation where you can move around the cells, can uh, sort them out with the um, electro electrophysiology movement, and by having marked the cells before with two epithelial markers, three mesenchymal markers, CD45 and MUX, we have been able to analyze the cells pretty much clearly, and show you now the results. For each cell, we would analyze if it was mesenchymal one, then it would appear red, if it's the first one cells here. Is a mesenchymal transition, red and green, this is epithelia only, green, fluorescent, and this is a lymph node, a lymphocyte, smaller cell, as fluorescent, and blue only, this is an impurity, so this is all the, the dapsy, fluorescent, indicating the nuclear presence. Okay. I mean, analyze several cells this way. We can came to clinical validation of the method. By comparing with research identification, we associated between clinical pathological features, CTCs, number distribution, population, correlation between CTC gene and special profile, 
all these things we will be able to eventually also be self isolated in the cheap machine, cheap and fast machine that I showed you before. But this was done slowly, one at least per, 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 per sample per day, instead of eight sample per day, like the can do, we could do much more. Okay. Here a feature. In this way, when the uh, there were all metastatic patients of both breast cancer. The higher number of epithelial cells positive in the bone was bone metastasis. Even involvement, lower number of mesenchymal cells, higher number of epithelial, lower number of mesenchymal cells, number of localization sites. When, when there was only one number, and the higher number of epithelial cells, and for F2 diseases, lower number of mesenchymal cells. But what was, was, was important was established the following fact: that when mesenchymal markers were together with the epithelial ones, so when the molecule, epithelial molecules expressing mesenchymal markers, then the, that was according to the blue lines. More than 50% of this was um, bad prognosis. While the prognosis was excellent, if, if less than 50% of the cells would express very kind markers in being epithelial cells. The number of CDCs expressing mesenchymal markers resulted to be prognostic factor both overall survival progression of free survival. It's an important finding because contrary to what we thought at the beginning, that the mesenchymal cells already were bad news, not bad news, and most of cells in transition that were the, the news are bad for the patient. The fraction of the cells expressing in the camel markers seems to correlate with our survival. The number of CDCs expressing in the camel markers is also the prognostic factor of survival survival and the progression free survival. We need to comp complete the comparison with cell search patients. We are doing this in collaboration with the institution in Padua and we are just starting doing it. We get patients your blood and do both. In part of they will do the cell search numeration. We do our machine numeration in Aviano. And then there will be single cells. I just give a lot in that case study. We hope to get in lot in another sixty five patients to like so hundred thirty originally planned in the two culture cells. The collaborators in this second part of the study were Dr. Daniel Giselli, Professor Bertrani, Antonio Bertrani, Carla Di Rex, Stefania Martinotto. Marie Sorrentino, maybe especially the Kerabul Foni, with around eighty percent of the work in this area. Statistical support in the Misra, Rita Tamarki and Elisabetta Rossi in Padua to the comparison with their search, Michele Morgante to do the Institute of Padromics in Udine to do the the genomic characterization of the cells, and Matteo Toretta and Fabio del Bain in our institution. And she come by the system has been helping by the terrible phony with the the array. I would like to thank my wife, your son. She's helped me a lot. Despite of having Parkinson's disease, you can probably notice from my speech, 
I've been able to be going around with her. She carries me everywhere. And thank you to you. I will be happy to take any questions you may have. Thank you, Dr. Skold. We, um, we appreciate your time and we love that informative presentation. Before we get started on the question and answer session, I just want to remind our audience how to submit questions. You can submit questions by typing them in the Q&A box. And that is found by clicking on the green Q&A button at the lower left of the presentation window. We will try to answer as many questions as we can. Okay, Dr. Schools, our first question. Wondering if the gene signature profile of the CTCs indicate if the circulating cells from the tumor have acquired the expression profile that is similar to a specific cell type generated during hematopiosis. I, I have problem in understanding your speech. I'm sorry. It's okay, Dr. Schools. Um, I'm going to read question number two. And if you remember, um, the green Q&A button that's on the bottom left of the screen, it's a green button with a question mark in it. Yes. Okay, yes, if you click on that, I'm going to be reading question number two. Okay. And if you go to the tagged section. Or display, question and answer, incoming. Uh, you want to go to the tagged. There's incoming and tagged. Okay. And we'll start with question number two. Number two. Only if the gene signature will profile CTC is indicated in circulating cell from the tumor and requiring a special profile it is similar. We have not yet analyzed the special profile of the cells. I, I listed that as a work to be done pretty fast, pretty soon, but not, we have not done it yet. We have done it in the, in the second part of the talk, in the slow analysis. And as you know, the special profiles are similar, but not quite the same. It, it can change the metastasis with respect to the primary tumor. But we have not completed this. It's just too preliminary to make a statement in this direction. Very good. Our next question is going to be, was the oxygen level monitored within the water droplets which were trapped in the oil? Oxygen level could change due to cell metabolism and can affect the metabolism of cells. That's question number four. Yes. We we make sure that results were reproducible. It means that the, the temperature was kept low when the metabolism was not to a place. Then was, the temperature was increased to room temperature for a while and then dropped again. Those minutes were. So we don't expect changes in, appreciable changes in the, in the oxygen concentration because the result, it seems to depend on the time. Next question. Dr. Scholes, how long was the time between the formation of water droplets and the observation of the droplets under microscope? What time between the formation of, oh, just a moment. Question how number five. Long? Yes. I think something like 20 minutes or so. Okay, next question. This be number six. Can the cancer cells be fluorescent labeled before spiking? The way you may yes. be able to tell if the acidic ones are the cancer cells without sorting the water droplets out. Yes, we've been doing that. And that's how we, we know it, basically. It can be labeled, then you can get the fluorescent of the labels, and then you can have it. But you don't want to do that normally, routinely, because that 
we we'll change the we change the, the analysis speed and and it is damaging the cell for for growth again and for culturing. But yes, we've done this. Very nice work. Do you think if there is pH difference inside the cell and extracellular, how about mitochondrion? Oh, yes. Yeah. The cells, we don't believe there's a lot of difference because the, the protons are getting out of the cell fast. And cells are, the environment is reasonably large so that um, the space for the protons not to re-enter the cells. In my opinion, there will be, the answer to your question will be no. There is no change for the a big difference between the inside and the uh, why while why the civilization is occurring, there's a gradient there. And we plan to measure the gradient in the future, but we're not done we're not done yet. Okay, question so, number eight, Dr. Scholes. Mm -hmm. Um, we have an audience member who would like to know if they have results on breast cancer cell lines and lung cancer cell lines. Is there a result that can the cell line and long? Yes, we do. Recently, I started doing some lung cancer, and that's how we hope to have more significant results because lung cancer is difficult to monitor and to have bioscopy from it. But um, yes, we have results with cancer and lung cancer cell lines. Thank you, Dr. Scholes. Now, if there are no more questions, I would like to once again thank Dr. Jacinto Scholes for his presentation. Dr. Scholes, do you have any final comments for us? No, other than I hope very much this matter will change the way to do early detection of cancer, for instance, because that the, the article I was mentioned to you, the one that came out in Cancer Letters at the beginning, July 1st, I mentioned indeed that one good application will be the early cancer diagnostics because when you have had cancer, it appears, then it, becomes, then it comes in again. You don't have to wait for the new metastasis to establish themselves. When the level of micrometastasis you already may have cancer lines in the blood, and if you see this, you can then act again with chemotherapy, making it life for the patient much better. That's my only remark. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to talk to you. Dr. Schultz, thank you so much. Today's yes. webcast will be available for on-demand viewing through February 2017. You will receive an email from LabRoots alerting you when this webcast will be available for replay. We invite you to forward that announcement to your colleagues who may have missed today's live event. We appreciate you joining us, and we look forward to seeing you next time. Goodbye. Bye-bye.